Hello and welcome to yet another Stephen Mendes video. My students at the university were given this circuit analysis problem to be solved using a simulation software on the computer. And they were also asked to work a mathematical solution to see if their simulation software came up with the right answer. And it gave them a considerable amount of difficulty to do and they requested my help. So I'm now going to go through the solution of the circuit you see there for the benefit of international students so you may have a better understanding of how to tackle problems like this. The first thing we need to do starting on the left is to produce a source transformation. Every uh, Thevenin circuit has a Norton equivalent so we can take the 10 kilo ohm resistor and we can put it in parallel with a current source and simply use Ohm's law to discover what the current would be on the current source. And I can make source transformation the subject of another video. However, we've performed a source transformation taking the 60 volt source and the 10k resistor and making it a 6 milliamp current source and a 10k resistor. So now you can see that it fits very nicely in parallel with the 20k and when we do a parallel reduction on that we've eliminated a bit of our circuit. So we also include the 24k because that's in parallel and the other current source and now we have two current sources and one resistor when we find the parallel combination of those three. And as you can see, it works out to 3 milliamps with a 5,217 ohm resistor across it. So we transition now to a new board. And the next thing we want to do is to turn that into its Thevenin equivalent by making it a voltage source with the same value of resistor via source, what is called source transformation. Now, we have a resistor, a 2K resistor that will be in series with this resistance from our original diagram so you could have copied that down or you can go back to the beginning of the video and check so we add in that series resistor of 2k which now becomes a 7217 ohm resistor in series with our voltage source you can check that and make sure you understand why that is so and we now want to put that into a norton circuit again so we put our 7217 ohm resistor, sorry I left off the ohms, into uh, across our 2.17 milliamp current source. There is our final circuit that we have br broken it down to. We have our Norton equivalent circuit on the left and then we have finally reached our resonant tank circuit. We have a, a coil, a capacitor, and a resistor all in parallel. So we have a parallel RLC circuit staring us in the face. But before we can continue with that, we need to combine those two parallel resistors. And when we do so, we end up with our simple RLC parallel circuit. Now I'm going to make the solution of these uh, the subject of another video uh, to explain the various how the various equations come about. But suffice it to say that since we have an actual RLC parallel circuit with actual component values, we are going to substitute them straight into the equation. So the first thing that we are going to do is to write a KCL equation where we have current terms adding up to our total current. As you can see, the right member is our total current converted to amps, and we have used the 
proper units in our three left terms so that we have ohms, we have henrys, and we have farads. Now, those equations there represent the, sorry, those terms represent the uh, mass that's involved for the coil or inductor and the capacitor. So, we want to make it easy for students to do and to duplicate. So, we are going to say that we have no initial charge on the capacitor and no current in the inductor at T equals zero. T equals zero is when the switch will be flown, thrown to connect the current source to our parallel circuit. And it will be essentially a dead circuit. At that point in time, there will be no charge or current on anything. And we will throw our switch, not shown in the diagram, at T equals zero to put a 2.17 milliamp current into our parallel circuit. So we've repeated that here now on the page so that we can follow it as we go, go through the solution. The first thing we need to do now is to differentiate that equation above. And when we do that, we see that we have a second derivative for the capacitor. We have a first derivative for the resistor and when we differentiate the integral, we just end up with V over 0 0.02 for the capacitor. So that's pretty standard calculus operation to differentiate throughout. Now what we need to realize is that in the general solution, we have produced a shortcut method of finding the important uh, parameters that will help us to decide what kind of a solution we are going to get for our differential equation. So the damping coefficient, which is labeled as alpha, is very specifically 1 over 2 times the resistance times the capacitance. So 1 over 2RC, we will show how we get that in another video, gives us our damping coefficient in nepers per second. And our natural resonant frequency of this parallel resonant circuit is 1 over the root of LC. So we have L and C there under our square root, and we work that out, and we see that this parallel resonant circuit has a natural resonant frequency, omega O, of 10,000 rads per second. Radians, that is. Okay, so now we copy that back so we can proceed with our solution. Now, what you should notice there is that our natural resonant frequency is way, way higher than our damping coefficient. And this is very significant because it means that based on other information which you will get from my other video on parallel resonant circuits, this is going to have imaginary complex roots. We are going to have complex conjugate roots of the solution of our characteristic equation, which is a quadratic equation. And uh, we find the damped frequency by swapping the two under the square root sign so that our damped frequency is omega O squared minus alpha squared. And we take the square root of that as shown and we find that our damped frequency has dropped from the natural resonant frequency by a few cycles to 9,935 rads per second. So what's the next step? Well, the next step now is to write the solution. Here is the general solution that we will get for complex conjugate roots in our characteristic equation. So this is a standard result that one will expect. One only has to pick from the standard results depending on whether your circuit is undamped, critically damped, or overdamped. In this case, our circuit is underdamped. So we have an oscillatory component which consists of the cosine sine there in the brackets, and we have a damping um, 
term, which is the exponential there on the left, which will cause our oscillation to die out over time. The typically underdamped waveform response. And that is reference to the voltage across the capacitor, which in this case is also the circuit voltage across everything. Now, the first thing we want to do in finding the solution, we have a solution right there based on the damped frequency and the damping coefficient, but we need to evaluate those constants, the arbitrary constants A1 and A2. And in order to do that, we need to use a little clever algebra to find out what A1 and A2 are going to be. Now, at T equals zero, V is going to be zero on the circuit because obviously the, the, the switch hasn't been thrown. So if V is zero and T is zero, then it means that the rightmost member, the sign, is also going to be zero. And uh, basically, our uh, cos zero is going to be one. So we have our exponential term also 1 because t is equal to 0. So we have 1 times a1 times 1 equals 0. So essentially a1 itself has to be 0, which makes life quite easy for us in this particular case. Now in order to find a2, we go back to our original equation and we realize that at t equals 0, when V also equals zero, our leftmost member drops out. There is no voltage across the resistor. Our second member drops out because there is nothing to integrate. We have zero at the top and zero at the bottom. And all we're left with is our differential, and it must equal 0 0.00217. So we divide by our capacitance, in order to isolate our differential, as shown, and we have our first derivative as 4,340 volts per second. That's the inrush into the capacitor at the beginning of the operation. So now we move now to consider what we're going to do with our solution. We can differentiate the solution as well, and we need to do that. So when we differentiate the solution, we end up with that result. That's just a standard um, differentiation of products there, as you would know, quite a straightforward differentiation. And on the leftmost side, we now have something in which we can plug our 4,340 volts per second that we just finished working out. Additionally, since this is at T equals zero, quite a few of these things are going to drop out. The E, for example, is going to be equal to one, and the signs disappear altogether because sine zero is zero, and the only thing we will be left with is the cos member, and uh, what the cost member is going to be one because the cost is cost zero is one. So we have one for the cost and we have one for the ease, nothing for the sign, zero for the sign. And therefore, what we end up with is our 4,340 4, equal to 9935A2 minus 1139A1. Make sure you understand this and why it's so. But what that results in, what that results in is that A1, since it is zero, it means, and at T is equal to zero, it means that our A2 is simply going to be the 4340 divided by our 9935. Our final solution, therefore, is a2 times the exponential term times the sine term. I've taken the time to use a pocket calculator to use the formula to work out some values of V at regular intervals of 0.5 of a millisecond. 
there you can see the values of V at different points in time, and you can clearly see that the value is declining over time, and also that the fact that some of them are positive and some are negative means that at that particular point in time, we are capturing the wave on either the positive or negative half cycle of its oscillation. So if you have a circuit simulation software on your computer, why not build a circuit and see the output? It's the typical sinusoidal damped waveform and uh, you should be able to capture these points and confirm these mathematical results with your software. Have fun and we'll see you in the next video.